Uh, cool. Okay, we'll kick off. Paul, Brett, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Gary. We have a unique three three person podcast today, so maybe we'll just give a quick overview of who's here. So, Paul, do you want to kick off and just give a quick overview of yourself? Yeah, sure. I'm Paul Byrne, the CEO of uh, Currency Fair. I guess I started my career way back as an accountant, Price Waterhouse, uh, back in the 1980s recessionary environment. And I ended up working with them in Ireland and the States and uh, the UK. And after that, I started down the, the entrepreneurial route. I worked with a company called Trintech, where I raised funds for it in the late 1990s. It took it public on the NASDAQ. I was directed there for about 11 years. And along that journey, I founded uh, two businesses, uh, one in treasury and one in healthcare management. And they did really well in mostly in the States. Um, 2010, started to work with a private equity firm to build another company um, on the back of the Trintec business called Cadency. Uh, that did really well. I grew that to basically about 60 million revenue in four years. And then we ended up selling that to another private equity equity firm, in which case I retired to, uh, back to Ireland. Um, I was a current customer of Currency Fair, actually, and that's how I came in touch with Brett uh, originally. You, you, you read my questions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, it was great. I actually, because uh, we, we had, our sell price was in US dollars. So uh, I used uh, Currency Fair then to just to transfer some of the dollars back into euros. And that's how I came in touch with the company. And then we had a mutual uh, connection through one of their one of Brett's investors at the time, uh, Frontline Ventures. So I knew some of the guys there from way back in the day. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, so I got in touch with Brett and that's how I really got involved in Currency Fair. Um, I became, I invested a little bit in the company and um, joined Brett, working with Brett, Brett on the team first. And then uh, we kind of reversed roles. Um, I took over as CEO and, and Brett uh, is a board member. Yes, that's actually one thing you've sped through so much there. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack, so we'll have fun yeah. doing that. And um, that was actually one question I was actually, we'll, we'll c- come on to it later as to how you guys actually just kind of switch roles. So Brett, you want to kick off and give an intro to yourself? Yeah, sure. So uh, it should become clear from my accent after not too long that I'm actually from Perth originally, uh, but I'm in Ireland now 20 years. So uh, I, most of my working life was, uh, was away from away from Perth. I started off as a as an electrical engineer, believe it or not, working in oil and gas. Uh, and then I sort of swiftly moved into programming roles, sort of a self-taught programmer, really. Uh, and that led me into finance. So I ended up working for, for banks. Um, and uh, which then really is what led to the uh, to the uh, the idea of currency fair, both my financial background plus the fact that I was an expat and therefore I often had to convert money. Uh, but uh, yeah, so so as a programmer, I, I sort of learned finance as I went into banking, and then I ended up having the programming skills to write in a lot of the initial um, uh, back back end algorithms, if you like, for currency fair. Okay, so you you were totally self taught. On the programming side, yep, yep, self-taught. I had a few big thick books. How did that even come about? How do you how do you decide? Yeah, you know what I'm going to do this weekend? Some programming. Yeah, well, actually, I, as uh, I was working in Perth as an engineer, and I had a, a good buddy of mine who was living in London, and he he was working as a programmer over there, and said, "Hey, why don't you come over? I can get you a job as a programmer in London." So, um, I, I packed up and, and came over and literally learned on the job. And what was your job then in London? What brought you over? Uh, in London, I was in London for two years uh, and I was working as a programmer in um, really just Microsoft Access and Visual Basic for an engineering company. So it was, each role has kind of trans- transitioned halfway into the next one, you know. And then you made the jump to Dublin or Ireland? Yeah, I came to Dublin in um, early 2000. Uh, thought I'd be here for six months, to be honest. Um, it was just a real sort of bit of an extension of the working holiday. And uh, yeah, came for six months and been here now 20 years. And did a job bring you over? Or did you just fancy you living somewhere new or what was it? It was uh, literally work. I was on working holiday visas at the time. Uh, visa ran out in London. To be honest, I, I'd kind of had enough of London by that stage after two years. Uh, found I could get a one year visa for Ireland, came over and, and did that. And then uh, liked it over here so much that I, uh, back then, I guess it was early 2000s and there, there were shorter programmers. So it was actually reasonably easy to get a visa to to stay longer as long as you were working in those those industries where there were shorter people like um, like IT at the time. So uh, that allowed me to extend uh, for a few years, rolling over, and then I naturalised as an Irish citizen in I think it was two thousand and nine. So so I'm Irish now. Okay. What a proud proud Irishman. <laughs> what 
what were you working at when you came over? Were you, were you reprogramming or, cause it's a big, big move to come over just for six months and then, you know what, stay forever and get naturalized. Yeah. Uh, well, I was working, um, again, programming. Uh, the first job I had over here was uh, an insurance company. And then the second one was, it was a bank. So, so I was, that's where I started to really pick up the financial side. Um, but again, the programming I was doing was very much desktop, visual basic, that kind of thing. It wasn't really web programming. It was, um, yeah, databases mainly. Okay. And so bring us then on to the currency fair journey. How did that start? Yeah, well, I guess the idea came about, um, really in from two directions the first was that as an expat i often needed to convert money so sometimes i'd be sending money back to australia other times uh, i'd need to bring money over uh, and after doing a, a few transactions like that over the years i finally um i kind of realized actually how expensive it was to do it it's um you, you know they kind of uh, the banks used to charge an upfront fee which you tended to make you think that was the only fee you know i'm paying 30 dollars to transfer this money or 35 euros or whatever it happened to be. Uh, but when I realized that the margin the banks were building into the exchange rate was was usually north of 3%. So if Australian banks would usually charge you about 5% of your money every time you moved it. Um, I started to think uh, that's not really very fair and there must be a better way to do this. And as I had other friends over here that had just come out, there was, there was some occasions where I realized that I was sending money back home where my friend was bringing money back the other way. Wow. So one day I actually said, hey, why don't you just send me the Australian dollars into my Australian bank account that you were going to send over here. Uh, and I'll give you some euros that I was going to send back there and, uh, and we'll cut out, you know, cut out the middleman, both save, you know, three, three, four, five percent. Uh, and also we, we don't have to pay any international transaction fee because it's just, you know, uh, domestic transfers on each end. Uh, and so it, actually a bit of a network of friends develop where we, we do this. Uh, and then at the same time, I had seen back, uh, I think it was sort of 99, 2000 times, a, a company quite well known now, but new back then called Betfair. Uh, and what they did was really revolutionize the betting industry by allowing people to, to bet against each other on a big marketplace, you know, so you could, you could offer up some odds and someone else could, could match them off. Uh, and sort of over the years, I guess from, you know, early 2000s to mid 2000s, this idea began sort of percolating in my head that what if we could take that principle of having a, a marketplace based exchange, um, but do it for people that wanted to move money. So, so you could, you didn't have to go find a, a friend of yours every time you wanted to transfer money, you could open this up to a, to a bigger network and, and host a, host a marketplace, which was regulated and can provide all the trust that was necessary. Uh, so that, that was really where the idea came from. And then what I guess was the catalyst to kicking off was, was probably the financial crisis. And I, I think if you, if you look back, quite a lot of fintechs did start in that period of a few years after the financial crisis. Because, you know, you had a lot of people who were working in finance, um, maybe either lost their job or found that their job was not as attractive as it used to be. Uh, and, and they decided this was the moment to, to, you know, put some of their ideas into practice. And that's really what happened with us as well. How did you, I think, I think the first step would be, how did you even take the first step? Because money just seems like such a huge, um, a huge barrier to entry for something like fintech. There's so many, maybe I'm just perceiving it, but there's so many, it seems to be so many regulations and, and barriers you have to go over. So what was your first step? Yeah, it's, it's a good question because starting off is, is in some ways quite a difficult thing. There's plenty of people, you know, you know, in the early years of currency fair, we had a number of people who who spoke to us and said, "Hey, I had this idea as well." So, you know, but it's great that you guys have actually done it. You know, so um, I, I think I, I had uh, three other co-founders when I started, and and we all I, I'd met them all individually, but they didn't know each other. But we had been talking about the idea amongst ourselves for quite a while, uh, and. Um, <sighs> Getting started was really, I think we all just sat around a table one day and said, look, why don't we actually make a go of, it, a go of this? You know, and we, we had the na naive idea that we'd all be able to continue with our day jobs, work on it in the evenings and the weekends, yeah. and then somehow all on one day we were going to quit our jobs and launch. You know, <laughs> that, that was the original idea. But uh, we, we talked about it. We started doing exactly that, working on our evenings and weekends. We, we got talking to Enterprise Island, um, and quite early on they gave us a, a big vote of confidence and, and put us on their uh, high potential startup program. Okay. And th then we end up talking to a, a few different mentor type people who, uh, you know, 
told us that th this whole idea of doing it in your evenings and weekends and going live on one day isn't going to work. You know, you need to think about raising some sort of uh, amount of capital to, to kick it off. Um, so we banded around different ideas for doing that for a while. And then we end up doing a, a large friends and family round. Um, three, three of the original four founders were in, were in banking or finance. And so we knew a few people that, you know, had, had a, had a, a chunk of money they might think about investing. So I spent the summer of 2009 uh, emailing, talking to, calling uh, loads of different friends. And we ended up doing our very first round was, I think, about 400,000 euros. Wow. Which we that's figured a, was that's enough. A big first round. Yeah, well, there were 46, I think, different shareholders in that round. So it was some, wow. um, and this is not a strategy I'd recommend <laughs> because <laughs> you, you do it with quite a complicated cap table, which has to be cleaned up down the line. But, you know, it was a good way to to get us started. It got us the, the servers. I mean, back in those days, it was kind of halfway between now and and a long time ago. In the sense that nowadays you can start off pretty quickly with with Amazon and various other tools. We actually were at the time where the cloud was just being talked about as an idea and it was working in certain instances, but people didn't feel it was that secure in a lot of areas. So we actually had our own servers and a rack and a data center. And so, so we had a bit more of an upfront cost than you would have now. Um, but 400K seemed to be a reasonable, a reasonable amount to, to get us going. And did that prompt you guys to leave your jobs and go at it full time or what was the transition then? Gradually, yeah. I mean, two of us went full time straight away. Um, and we, so we started working on it and then the, the third uh, guy, John, came on maybe three or four months later. And, and so we, we could try to minimize salaries. None of us, unfortunately, had enough money that we could afford to work for nothing at the start. So we still did need to, to take some sort of salary, even though it was lower than, than what we were used to. But we, we needed enough to get by. So we, we couldn't all go full time straight away. But we did transition. And so by the time we went live, we had, uh, we had all four of us on board. What was the, the timeline between starting, getting the funds and going live? Uh, so we started working on it at the start of 2009, really. That was just the sort of weekend weekend stuff and evenings. Uh, we had two of us full time by, I think it was around June or July, uh, which was r roughly around the time we raised the money um, and or the first round anyway. And then we went live on near the end of April of the following year, 2010. Yeah. So it was a, quite, a, quite a lot of upfront work to, to get it. You know, you can imagine we had to get regulated. It was it, moving people's money around is not something that you can just throw together on a website and kick off. You know, there's a lot of groundwork to be done. Yeah, so kind of bring me through that. What, how did you even know what to do? How did you even know, okay, we need this license or this, we need to satisfy this regulation. What happens? Yeah, well, we got it. We, we literally just talked to people. I mean, we were in finance. One of, one of the original founders, Sean, was, uh, was an FX um, uh, trader on, on a treasury desk at a bank. And so he, he had some knowledge really in, in terms of getting banking partners arranged because even though we were, we were kind of undercutting the banks, if you like, from the FX part, we still needed banks because we have to be able to receive and pay out money. So we need local banking services. So he was instrumental in getting that side of it set up. On the regulatory side, we just uh, engaged a consultant and asked, asked the questions. We actually got caught in a bad time because I remember in 2009 was when uh, the payment services regulations actually came into force. So we actually started, did a whole application under the old process and then we're told, oh, sorry, well, we're not going to regulate you under that because it's changing over. So we had to start again and uh, start from scratch at the same time. That as a result of the crisis, was it? Or what brought that in? Uh, I don't think it was directly as a result of the crisis, but I'm not 100% sure on that. It was a European-wide uh, payment services directive, it was called, that each country then had to, had to implement over a timeline. So. Okay, so 2009, that would have been pretty much the middle of the recession? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, all, all the, it was really 2007 and eight where everything tanked in the housing uh, and the securitization markets in the US, wasn't it? And then the recession kind of kicked off from from there. So yeah, that I think that was important that it was in, in the recession for us in some ways. Why was that? Because what one thing we found, we knew it would be hard, but we maybe didn't know quite how hard it would be is getting people to change behavior is really, really difficult. No matter how compelling your proposition is, people are inherently just want to keep doing what they've always been doing. So, you know, the fact was you could transfer money with us and you would, you would literally pay 90% less than you would wow. with a bank. Right. So, and yet people still didn't, immediately switch <laughs> you know it'd be great to think everyone was rational and go well i shouldn't be paying 10 times what i need to pay why don't i just use this but um it didn't happen um 
and I think it happened. It did happen for us faster because of the fact that it was a, a recession. So people wanted to save money. You know, if you can imagine during the boom uh, in Ireland, um, would people have really taken the time to sign up with a new provider? That certainly people I spoke to thought they had tons of money. You know, but co come come into a recessionary type environment, and anything you can save suddenly becomes hugely more important. So so that helped. But also, what what helped us a lot was we were able to get a lot of really good press coverage early on. I remember within maybe two months of launching, we had um, almost a full page article in the Guardian on a, on on our company, and that was purely because we were saving people money, it was a recession, we were a challenger to the banks, and if you remember at the time, banks were not very popular <laughs> back mm. in those days, right? So you had everything in our favor that, you know, journalists wanted to write about this thing. We, when we got this massive art article in The Guardian, and I remember um, uh, someone from Enterprise Ireland who used to head up their financial division in London actually rang us and said she couldn't remember uh, the last time an Irish company had got such a big article in, in, in such a major publication and then because of that uh, demographic um, of, of that readership we ended up getting immediately getting a lot of customers who were who were retired British expats um, living out in Spain and France and and needed to send over pension payments or savings and so on so press press early on was hugely important for us and I think it was largely driven by the fact the environment we were in at the time that's so interesting. I think people discount press an awful lot because, you know, it's not digital and sexy, but the impact it can have, especially when, you know, you know your market, like you guys knew who, who you wanted to target. How did the Guardian article come about? That's so massive. Yeah, I, I can't remember. I, like the very first article we got was in Australia, in the Australian, which was kind of quite nice for me, I guess, being from there along with one of my other founders was from there, co-founders. Um, and that was in our first week of, of launch. And that was due to a trade mission we went down with Enterprise Island uh, to, to, to Australia. And I got chatting to a journalist on that. But the Guardian one was maybe a couple of months later. And I think by that stage, we'd had a few articles in some other publications and, and maybe it got picked up through there. And so I think with that one, someone just contacted us and, our, and one of the journalists just contacted us. So they obviously heard about us from somewhere else. It's amazing once you get one bit of validation from somewhere, some other media will inevitably start to nibble on it as well. Definitely, yeah. And, and when trust is important to you, like it is with a, with a financial business, then press is great because you know, people read something in the paper and they just assume that, it, you know, that the journalist has done all their due diligence for them you know, and that it must be fine to use them. So, so I think it was pretty good for us. That was one of the questions I had. Actually, I put it out on social media that I was going to be chatting to you guys and one person contacted me and asked, as a young startup, how did you build trust? Because obviously you're dealing with people's money. It's the most important thing in the world to a lot of people. How did you guys build that early? Yeah, well, partly the press, um, you know, those, those sort of articles uh, lent trust. We had all the top-notch security on the website, you know, but I guess every website says it has top-notch security, but we made a point of making that clear. We were regulated, um, which obviously we had to be, but, you know, we made that very clear as well. Uh, and then you really just try and be an open and honest in your communications. We, we also wanted to make sure that we always answered the phone. Um, and so we, we'd have, you know, four, or even, even when there are five, six of us, uh, we all had the phone lines at our desk and we'd all, we'd all pick up answer calls. And, we, you know, we wanted to make sure we answered every call and got back to emails really quickly because we thought that would help um, with the trust uh, factor. I think if, if you're a bit unsure about a company and you can't reach them, on the phone straight away, then that's not going to help either. So it was just a lot of little things, really. There was no magic bullet on trust, but it was, it was just a combination of all of those things. Okay. So that brings up to 2008 ish. I'm going to jump over to Paul. Paul, you mentioned you started numerous companies there. Can you just bring me quickly through the kind of how you started or even why you started transitioning from accountant to founder? Uh, well, it actually was, it happened by, I guess, chance initially in that, in 2001, there was a NASDAQ crash. So there was a US recession and we suffered because of that. Like our revenue dropped dramatically overnight and we ended up having to reduce our headcount at the time from about 630 people down to about 50. So it was a huge reduction in staff and we did it over two or three tranches. So I ended up initially managing the program because I was the, the finance guy. And then ultimately I ended up just taking over the rem rem remnants of the company that was left in terms of managing, you know, the, the remaining business and trying to get it back up and grow again. So I, like I was literally in some respect trying to deep end 
to actually take over running a business that we were trying to turn around at the time. And it probably was the best thing that ever happened because while, you know, the old sink or swim uh, analogy doesn't really work for everybody, it kind of worked for me and it got me hooked um, for, on terms of being an entrepreneur. And like my, both of my parents are entrepreneurs. You know, I come from a farming background and my mother used to run a and b basically as well. And she was quite, quite, um, early on in starting the Irish Farmhouse Association for like farmhouse holidays back in the 1960s. So like I come from that kind of small business background. So that really got me engaged. And in 2007, 2005, then we started a treasury company, which I didn't start, but I took over managing a treasury business. So I, was, I didn't found it, but I, was, I grew it. And I, there I had two other guys that, Irish guys actually in this, were living in the States at the time they joined me in managing the company and then the three of us then founded the next two businesses together. Okay. So like Brett, I like guys I knew that I could, you know, that I worked with before. So we started this healthcare business in Chicago, um, 2007, and it was a fantastic business. We were trying to help hospitals, uh, save money in terms of getting reimbursed the correct amounts from the insurance companies, which is a hugely complex business in the States. And in fact, it's never been solved even to like 12 years later, it's still a problem. So we started a business in Chicago uh, because there were a lot of uh, med tech startups in Chicago generally. So it was a good base of employees, you know, which to draw from in terms of a startup. There was a direct flight from Dublin to Chicago, uh, which made it easier to get home. And then there were also flights uh, every hour to Dallas. And Dallas is where the other two guys were living at, at the time and it's where I had been based with the treasury company. So it kind of geographically was a great idea. Weather-wise, it was terrible. <laughs> it really was freezing cold in the middle of winter, uh, and then you know baking hot in summertime. But the business was fantastic, and we started like we got that to about ten million revenue in about two years, uh, and then we actually we sold it. Uh, we didn't want to sell it, but we were very, really lucky that uh, in two thousand and nine, which was in the middle of the crisis, we managed to get the largest healthcare provider in the U.S. to sign a, a five-year contract with us to enable us our software to run their kind of whole invoicing and billing scheduling for 178 hospitals wow. and that was fantastic and they like they were really supportive of us as a small company they liked us as individuals and we spent a lot of time in uh, working with them uh, in in Tennessee but then we realized we probably didn't have enough people to service the contract <laughs> so, oh, wow. so so we actually uh, founded uh, we actually got a, a, a one of their existing partners to buy the company Right, so it was somebody who already had a contract with them uh, in the same area, like a, a, actually a, a public company uh, called the Advisory Board, and they ended up buying our business, a healthcare business. So that was great. And then were they the, like a rival to you guys, or how did that happen? No, they were a consulting company. So okay. we we were, so they were actually providing consulting services in the same area as our software was solving problems for. So they knew about our software. They probably had used it in some of the hospitals anyway, in terms of helping the hospital manage their whole processes better. Uh, so that was uh, so that was kind of a pretty seamless and one seamless transition in one respect because the people we sold it to understood the business intimately. So it was you know it wasn't that difficult to sell. How did um, that happen though? How did the you go from you know two years sale like how did even sales process start? How you know did you oh we had a bank we had a, we, 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 it we no we 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 found we had an investment bank uh, who actually helped us because at some point we were going to have to raise a lot of money for this company uh, or do something with it. So we actually had an investment bank who were helping us from Chicago and we got to know them pretty well. So they, they basically uh, helped us um, to, I guess, through a whole, to a process of our funding or selling. And then when it became clear, like the funding would work, even though it was in the middle of a recession, which wasn't easy to raise money in, the sale was better for the business. And like we didn't, we, we, we knew the people in the healthcare business really well in our, at the, cost, at the customer level. And we didn't really want to let them down because they have to place a huge vote of confidence in us, like a small company winning a huge big contract. Uh, so th the sale made more sense for us. Uh, but that just, I guess, fueled our ambition then even further <laughs> to start the next company. Because the next, after we, I think we probably hadn't even finished celebrating the sale of the previous one when we concocted the idea for the next one. Uh, over yeah, and it is true we did concoct it on a on a napkin in a bar. Uh, <laughs> the origin story, go on. So, yeah, no, we did it. We took we, we were because we see we have been a public company as well, so we knew all the problems public companies had in one end accounting and reporting. Okay. And the consulting company we sold our healthcare business to had the same issues in healthcare businesses. So we knew, we knew pretty well that there was a problem to be solved for. So we devised a, a proposition for a SaaS product called Cadency, and we we. 
literally scoped it out, knew exactly what it needed to do. We were able to leverage products we already had worked on before in the treasury area. Okay. So we, we kind of knew what we knew. The idea wasn't new to us. Like we knew the problem. We knew there was a solution that we could create for it. And we got backing from a private equity firm or high growth uh, in, in Boston. So we literally drafted it all out basically on a napkin um, in a bar in Texas. And then over the next couple of weeks, we started working on the idea. We created, it took about probably around 10 months to really bring something to market um, from a product point of view. And then 2011, 2016, it kind of grew pretty, like it took off and grew pretty aggressively and pretty well. And we ended up hiring a lot of salespeople and expanded the headcounts probably to around 220 or so. Um, and then we just, 11, that's again, like Brett, in the middle of the recession. Yeah, yeah, no, we look, it's, it's doubts or did you have any kind of like, oh, wait, this mightn't fly at this time? No, I think Brett and I have one thing in common is that we're both probably eternal optimists. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> because uh, yeah, you'd have to be an optimist to start a company because, you know, um, because if you like, you're, otherwise you'd be second guessing yourself the whole time. So we, we were pretty confident there was a need. We had somebody who was prepared to support us from an investor point of view. And we knew there was a problem to be solved and we knew how to solve the problem. And we'd had the problem ourselves because I was CFO of this public company, you know, going back bef before him. And, and so, so we knew exactly what the issue was. Um, and the trick for us really was to try and get the first couple of customers signed up. So you asked Brett about how do you build trust in financial services, which is a different a different plan and building trust in like an enterprise software business, like enterprise software, you basically need your first two or three clients, you know, to implement the software for the, the trials or ever to go well. And then them to issue, give you references. Like the difficulty is every people get fed up giving references the whole time, all the time. So you got to keep building and building momentum. So we needed a couple of early wins and we got them. We had a few kind of friendly customers. In fact, some of the customers in the healthcare business also needed the software on the, on the business side. So we're able to go back to them as well and get them to to agree to trial the software. So we got up and running, and um, it was we were fortunate with the funding because we had one investor who was prepared to put a lot of money into the company to actually fund the growth. So we didn't need like Brett to do an angel round or to you know to bring a lot of investors along. We only had one other investor, which was. Um, and it worked and it took off and then we just this expanded and grew. Before, I noticed you kind of have a thread of, you obviously have an excellent stellar reputation wherever you go and you just keep building and building. Was this someone you'd worked with previously who, who knew your credibility? Yeah, what happened was the, we didn't know them, but they knew us because when we were in the healthcare business, we had a couple of partners um, as well. Like, uh, And one of those partners, their main investor was Spectrum uh, Equity from Boston. So they knew all about us because they'd heard about us from their investee company. And um, so we never met Spectrum at all until they came along and met us um, at the end of 2010 and talked about, you know, uh, our company, what we were going to do next. And it was through that whole conversation that, you know, we ended up basically doing something with them. Um, yeah. So it literally was working with people who knew us and, and they turned out to be a fantastic partner for us. And then working with people I'd worked with before. It's like Brett, when you started the currency fair, you started with, generally start business with people you know and you can trust. It just gets easier, and we were able to divide the work between the three of us. Um, you're, you know, so it was it was unusual. You know, you had a, a company based in the, in Texas, in Dallas, where three Irish people running it, basically employing lots of uh, American people, and and ended up employing lots of fifty people in England and a few in Australia, and all over the, in Hong Kong, and all over the world. So it was great to start because people would always ask you. Why did three Irish guys start a company in Texas? <laughs> and it really was great because we could we could have meetings with people that that nobody else could get, because we leveraged the Irish American angle. We we leveraged Enterprise Ireland where we could. Um, we were able to have conversations with people about you know things in th like in terms of well why did we start in Texas? Um, which pe so people were naturally curious about what we were trying to do, and the fact that we already had experience made it easier for to have a real conversation because we. We knew exactly what we were talking about because we all lived it before. It's like Brett with currency fair. People yeah, love stories. He, yeah, and people love stories. Um, you know, so and that was it. Took off then and, and it worked out worked out great for us and uh, worked out really well. Um and you know we were three able to finance guys you know, though, right? Uh, yeah, three yeah, three finance guys. Although I suppose I hadn't been working in finance since about two thousand and two, two thousand and three. So I've been out of the finance realm for a stage nine nine years. Okay. Um the second guy uh, from Cork, he had been out of finance for about six years because he had been the product manager in the healthcare business. So he was really on the product side. Okay. And then 
third guy from Kildare, uh, he was basically operations, finance, HR. He was everything as well. And, and sales. How did you build a SaaS product though? That's what I'm trying to figure out is how did three Irish guys uh, in Texas build a SaaS product then? Uh, well, we just well we 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 designed we designed what it needed to do. We knew where to get the building blocks from, so we were able to basically inherit. Like we inherit, we actually bought a small business as well, which already had R and D capabilities in order to help us okay. uh, grow it, grow it and scale it. And in fact, it's probably even easier to start now because, as Brett said, like so much you know, there's op- so much open source software now, so much cloud software available, um, and so many I suppose engineering offshore engineering centers. You know, it's, it's probably easier even starting out than it was back then. Um, but back then, and then as we developed and grew, we couldn't find enough engineering people f- fast enough locally. So we ended up, first of all, going to India. And then that was fine, but it was too far away, you know, time, time zone wise. So we ended up uh, opening a shared service center or center in Costa Rica, which was oh. uh, pretty neat because it was same time zone as, as Texas. And it was a bit of two and a half or three hour flight, like literally direct south flight. And um, so that was kind of not a bad place. I can't think of. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty good. Cool. Really, spot to be heading down to. No, it was handy. No, it was grand actually. It was it was great for um, uh, and then we you know and a lot of some of our customers had operations down there as well. So is that fact, what brought two, you there? Yeah, two yeah, and two of our customers helped us. Two of our uh, larger customers um, actually uh, helped us set it up. You know, and these are two like massive uh, public companies in the states, and they they actually helped us set it up uh, basically as well because. Like people were invested in our success. Like we had great customers who really wanted us to succeed, um, and they were prepared to help, uh, basically as well, which was which was great. What dro- what drove that though? Because it seems to be a marker of all your relationships is strong interrelationships with clients. It's not like a them and us situation, which is very common. So how did you foster that? Uh, well, I, I guess I have a philosophy, and in fact, I have to say there's something actually I noticed when I joined Currency where Brett had it as, as well, which was that business is all about people. Right. Ultimately, you know, people make sales, people build software, people, you know, service or do provide customer service to other people. So we were, we were very much always a people company. You know, the way even when we sold, the way we were able to, um, you know, pay bonuses to, to our staff at the sales proceeds, which they weren't expecting and things like that. Like we were very people oriented. Uh, I mean, we, we had to be. Like, don't forget, we were like, growing the company, hiring lots of new people who didn't know anything about the company when they were hired. So therefore, they had to be, you know, onboarded pretty quickly. They had to be trusted pretty quickly because, you know, you couldn't micromanage people and hire them that fast. So we, we got really strong around culture, around processes, around accountability, around, I guess, self-accountability probably more than anything else. So we really, we really were people-oriented. Um, I know it, you say you, you start, we started as three accountants, right? At the end of the day, uh, accountants generally aren't known for their people, people skills. <laughs> I'm well, glad we, I get, that on me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was waiting for it. <laughs> I got to get it out there first. Uh, we, uh, like we, were a bit, we were a bit different, I guess, because we'd all been on the business side, you know, for a while. And we all knew about the value of relationships. So we really were partnered with people. Like we weren't, it was, look, every relationship wasn't perfect. You know, some of our customers, you know, did have issues and challenges around using the software. Like, like any. We had to step in and get them, um, you know, fixed if there, if there were bugs. So, so basically, we, but you generally, you know, we, um, met people halfway or more than halfway. So, we, like we, you know, we did have one situation where we won large, one very large uh, public company, and there was a bug in the software and it didn't work, and it was co- it was genuinely causing them issues. So, you know, so what I did was I just flew to their head head, head office and uh, got a meeting with the group CFO. Uh, and the chief accounting officer at the, at the time. And the, the CAO was very unhappy with the software and really um, not keen to keep going with the contract. And I had said, look, it's software. We make mistakes. It was our mistake. We're fixing it. But just step back and think of the bigger picture here. All, like once you guys get up and running fully, look at what it's going to do for your company and your savings. And I got, and the CFO, I got the CFO to agree with me and that kind of smoothed the waters. And, you know, that was just an, an example of how, ultimately relationships is what drives every business forward and currency fair is no different like ultimately our customers trust us with their money and it's their money not our money so you know it's about relationships and people want to say for money. a SaaS company to say that though for a primarily computer software based company to actually have people at the front i think that that signifies something very special about it 
Yeah, exactly. And, and uh, it's one of the, I suppose, pieces of advice and, uh, that you know, we give people starting a company is, look, ultimately think of the people, the people you're employing at one level, the people you're interacting with as partners and the people you're servicing with your customers. And you just need to align all three of those in some way to make it work. Um, but ultimately, that business is about people. 2011 to 2016 for you. Yeah, 16. Then 16, I we sold the company to a private equity firm, another private equity firm uh, based in Austin, Texas, uh, called Vista Equity Partners. And then I actually, uh, I stayed with, I sat on with them for six months to for do, do a transition because at that point I was definitely, you know, coming back to Ireland full time. I'd been traveling back and forward for about 15 years. Okay. Was that so, the reason for the sale or, or what prompted the, the sale? No, the sale, they, they came to us. Uh, they approached us uh, and over a year, they made a couple of offers over the space of a year. And then finally, they made us an incredibly generous offer. And um, we decided like, okay, now was, now was as good a time as any <laughs> because the offer was so good. <laughs> There's enough zeros yeah. at the end. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you get, yeah, exactly. So it was, it was you know, and, and it was it was probably, I wouldn't say there's never a right time or wrong time. You can, like, there's, you can get, look, uh, sometimes you're in, a, in the right place at the right time. And we were, and sometimes you're a bit lucky and we probably were lucky as well. Um, but the, you know, the, the and, and, and when that moment happens, then you just got to be realistic, you know, as much as it, pained us at the time to actually sell the company because we were in a significant growth trend we also have to be realized that look somebody else put investing more capital in the company can make it grow faster and make it more successful and and frankly since we did sell the company it's gone from strength to strength like they've probably doubled revenue again they've made two acquisitions you know it's now a phenomenal company um in the us so yeah it was a good time um to to come back to ireland and then i came back and i was uh, probably six months. I decided I wouldn't do anything for a while. And like, and people had advised and said, advised me. I talked and said, look, don't rush into the next thing. Um, and I need a bit of consulting. You know, I started a business called Accelerate Success, which was free mentoring um, on a paid forward basis for small startups oh, in Ireland. Okay. Um, and you know, and that worked out quite well. And basically, as well, um, you know, made, and I made some investments through that vehicle too in smaller businesses. And then, then I got more involved with Brett, you know, uh, in terms of getting more involved in Currency Fair because while I was a customer of the company, I actually didn't know Brett personally. And then I got to meet Brett then through mutual contacts at Frontline Ventures, and that's how we kind of got involved. And then I'll I got back over to Brett now in a second, but I just want to talk to you on that mentoring thing. Is that still running? Uh, yeah, no, I still, I still do mentoring, yeah, but I don't do as much of it, to be honest, because, like, obviously, this is Currency Fair is full-time. Um, but, yeah, I do have a, I mentor a couple of companies still, and I, you know, have a couple of investments as well, and uh, I kind of try to help them out. But, uh, to be honest, I actually did, did find that one of the challenges of mentoring is, is that um, if you, when you're doing it for free, people don't necessarily listen, you know? That's why I'm asking you because yeah. I know I get asked a little bit more, much more successful friends of mine get asked all the time. And we were having that debate literally only a few, a few weeks ago. So it's interesting you bring it up is that it's free, you know, you invest hours and hours into it, but then there's no kind of follow through on it. So yeah. How did you. Well, I started charging for it. Yeah. That's, so, what, yeah. that's what I thought the answer would be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. I did and uh, I found people listen more and you know, it was, it was pretty simple. Like, you know, it's, it was their time and their money, right? So consequently they were more invested than at that point in trying to get value for their, their money or their investment. Um, now I still was, I still went, I mean, I still did like, you know, what I would call coffee mentoring, right? For smaller startups, like people who maybe 10 people or less and, you know, meet people for coffee and, and, and I still, by the way, I still do that, that today. Like I'm happy to meet anybody who's kick starting a business for a cup of coffee if they want to bounce some ideas off me or ask me a question, you know, I'm not opining on their business proposition or their marketplace or, but if they've got practical issues around how do you start off, where do you go, how do you get your first customer, I'm happy to do that. And that's fine because that's just helping people out. That's, that's what we all need to do, right? In you know, it's a fine line, I think. I think it's very difficult as well. How do you find that line between mentoring, advice? You, know, you want to help everybody. You, want to, you do want to pay yeah. it forward, as you say. So it's, 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 a, yeah, it's a fine one. Yeah, it's a tricky one. And uh, I found actually it was easier paid forward when you charge people for it because then there was much more focus. And then people could come with an agenda. You know, if they're yes. if they, you know they have specific things they want to focus in on if they're if they're if they're part of a program, basically as such. Cool. Brett, bring us up from so we finished with you in twenty ten. So kind of bring us forward for the next kind of four or five years of the journey up to where Paul was. Okay. Um well, a huge amount happened over in that period. I know it's a long imagine. question. It's a very uh, expansive <laughs> question. So go wherever you want with it. <laughs> we uh, so look, we 
we took off um, pretty well initially with the, with the press articles, and you know we were we had a small smallish marketing budget, um, just mainly digital digital type marketing, um, and, and we were getting really good growth, primarily driven by um, by sort of free freeish channels like the press and through uh, referral word of mouth. So that proved to be our our strongest channel and, and is is still one of the strongest if not the strongest channel today because we were offering such a compelling value prop compared to what was already out there that people just wanted to tell their friends and because a lot of our customers were expats as well expats tend to have a pretty strong network um, you know you tend to hang around with other people from home and you do believe it or not talk about things like sending money so we we hear uh, boring as it sounds it's, it's actually a big topic of conversation among expats uh, so we were getting a lot of uh, driving a lot of growth through that way um, and, and and likewise as we grew the the, the normal things started to happen you know in the sense that uh, I, I remember clearly one of our biggest challenges I think early on would have been literally when we moved from about 12 people where we were sitting in one room so we you know early on we were in a serviced office building so we had we had our own room but in this shared workspace type thing um, and we got to about 12 people where we managed to have one long room where we were all at the one table. And then we got an extra couple of people and we split out into two rooms. Uh, and and that, that was mainly the tech group split out from uh, the rest of the group. And that, that was a challenge. We didn't really realize at the time what a challenge it was, but looking back, um, you know, that is one of the challenges of scaling is, you know, when, when all 12 of us were in this one room, we heard, you know, all the tech people heard the phone calls that someone was getting from a customer about something that wasn't working. You, you know, so everyone was just up to speed on what was going on. As soon as we separated, that became a lot more difficult. Um, oh, interesting. And I think it's, I think it's, uh, it's true with every business. It's, it's that real challenging point where, um, you know, you can no longer rely on everyone knowing what's going on and you have to suddenly start devoting a lot of time and energy into communication across the company. Um, and then as you get bigger and bigger, that, that, you know, obviously just gets worse and worse and more and more and more of a challenge, right. To, to keep up to date with that. Um, and so that happened, we moved, we moved offices a couple of times and as we got bigger, um, you know, we, we started to develop all the processes and, and procedures that are required to make things work at a, at a larger scale than when it was small. Um, uh, so, so that's one thing I remember. We also did a lot of um, funding rounds uh, and looking back, I wish we'd raised more less frequently um, because, because I think I spent probably roughly seven years as CEO. Um, I was probably more than 50% of my time was in fundraising or fundraising related activities rather than oh. building the business. Um, and that's because we did a lot of rounds. We, we, you know, every growing startup company has to balance, um, you know, the aggression of trying to expand versus consolidating, you know, the business that you have. And w the way we set our pricing and everything initially is that we, we knew that, we could operate the business, the underlying business at a profit. In other words, even though we were charging very little for these transactions, because we had good technology and ways of doing things, we, we could, we, you know, we make a profit per transaction. We can keep the thing running, but at the same time, you need to be hiring more tech people because uh, you want, there's all these other products you want to do. There's various other things you're looking at. So you're trying to, you're always losing money um, because you're investing a lot of money to expand and, and getting that balance right. Um, and, and based on your calculations of, of how much you need to raise in your runway, one of those is your revenue and how much you expect that to grow. Um, and so we were trying to balance that. And, and looking back, we should have raised more money or done a little bit less on the money that we had because we were always trying to push it too fast, if you like, for the amount of, amount of money we'd raised, which meant that pretty much as soon as you closed around, you had to start thinking about the next round. Um, okay. Is there an element of that though? I know friends of mine who have fundraising or fundraising now, there's an element of you have to always nearly be raising because the social proof of seeing a raise triggers interest in a bigger raise. How did you balance that? Like, how did you go, okay, we need to raise X this time? Um, that was, it was partly we had a goal for what we'd raise and then partly it was driven by investors and, and those discussions. And so, I mean, we did I don't even know, Paul might know how many actual rounds we did, but it was, it was a number of rounds. Uh, you know, there's been a couple of rounds since Paul, Paul's been there and I, 
done several prior to that. So um, looking back at it, you know, when I'm, when I'm advising companies as well, I always tell them to raise way more than you think you need to, not, not because I did, but because I wish I had, you know, so okay. the, 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 all that time you spend fundraising is taking you away from working on the business, you know? Um, so, so that, so that, that, com communication and, and fundraising would be the two probably biggest areas that, I learned from over, over that period um, but you know in general we expanded headcount we, we were getting more 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 customers we, we even did some TV advertising at one point I think it was around 2014 um, with Sebastian Chabal uh, the rugby oh, yeah. uh, dressed as a fairy some people may remember, <laughs> I remember that, that now. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard uh, not to. <laughs> yeah so, so that that was a uh, that was that was an interesting time and the ad the ad itself did pretty well um, but but it's a long payback on that kind of expenditure. You know, we, we were still getting signups from that ad two, three years later, okay. um, but, um, but it, you know, in a direct response type type thing, it, it, it's hard to, harder to measure. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, there were, there were lots of highlights. We had, we had some challenges as well. Um, in fact, two external shocks, if you like, that came in fairly quick succession around t late 2015 and then 2016 is we had our main um, banking partner, so, so we did, just to clarify, we have we do the international transactions through Currency Fair, and we clear at different at bank accounts locally in each in each country. So, you know, we have a banking partner in Australia that will accept money in Australia and, and pay it out and um, pay it out in Australia, and that's how we're and, and likewise in in euros and sterling and, and dollars and various other things. So, what that allows us to do this so much more cheaply because we're only using you know, domestic banking system. So we can do free transfers, you know, faster payments or SEPA payments uh, on each end. And we handle the FX part. So, so we don't actually send money through it, through, a, you know, the old cumbersome international SWIFT thing, right? So that's one of the reasons yeah. it's cheaper. But that, but, you know, the ability to make and receive these payments is, is core to the model. And in 20, I think it was 2015, our main banking partner basically told us that we had 30 days and they were exiting the, the uh, money services businesses. So, so that they were no longer interested in providing th this functionality for us. Not that they felt there was anything wrong with this, just that they didn't want to do it anymore. They were getting <laughs> out that side of the business or what, what was the reason? Yeah, that's all they told us. Like literally it was, it was that poorly done um, from our perspective. Um, now we had some days. backups. We, you know, we knew that was a, you know, a critical part of our business. So we had some backups, right? But they weren't quite as ready to go as we thought they were. Uh, and even though we, we, we had no point where we couldn't make payments, we, we had a problem with, you know, we tried as best we could to notify all our customers to, to, to you know, our banking details have changed. You now need to send money into this account, not the original one. Oh, okay. Turns out lots of people weren't either reading our emails or maybe they were going to junk or they weren't even logging in. So they kept sending money to these old bank accounts. Mm -hmm. So we ended up with a, um, not everyone obviously, but a significant portion of people. And, because this had been done by our banking partner so abruptly, they were not, uh, we couldn't get, get that money back for them. We just had to wait. And, and the bank was taking sort of four or five weeks to bounce the money back to people. So obviously we had a, um, a customer services nightmare, if you like, trying to deal with all of these claims and, and tell people that, look, the money will be returned to you, but it's going to take a few weeks and we can't do anything about it. You know, so No one wants to hear that, really. <laughs> no, exactly. And it was really tough. And luckily, it wasn't, um, it wasn't all our customers and most of them had been notified, but still it was a, you know, it was a, it was a tough period for, for us and, and for those customers who were affected by it. Um, and then, then really in quick succession to that, we had, we had Brexit. Um, and, and specifically the vote of Brexit in 2016. And, and we found that as that was approaching, what, one of the things we learned um, is that people, when it comes to people, particularly expats, um, sending money, they don't just do it necessarily regularly every month. So some, some do, right? It's, it's a pension and they need the money out in Spain. So every month they, they do a transfer. But what actually happens, and I find it quite fascinating, and I, I, when I think about it, I would do the same thing myself, is that people tend to wait. If, they, if they've some discretion over the, the timing of the transaction, they will often wait. Um, you know, and so you might get someone who's doing something every month for a while, and then they stop for a few months. Uh, and then all of a sudden they do three or four months transfer at once. And when you, when you analyze that data, you see that it's actually driven by where the exchange rate is. So um, if people are say Brits uh, in Spain, um, 
and sterling weakens. So they're suddenly like, oh, hang on, I'm not going to send money over when the rate's so bad. And then they wait. And then if the rate sterling rises, then people pile in and start transferring again. So um, interesting. I didn't think people would be keeping such a close eye on it. I guess yeah. if it's your pension or whatever, you know, you're going to be. You see stuff. the difference, right? If, yeah. if it drops. And, and so with Brexit coming up, sterling was kind of dropping. But most people, um, like myself included, thought that it would be a Remain vote and that as soon as the Remain vote happened, sterling would rebound. But what we saw was in that early period, you know, three or four months leading up to um, leading up to the vote itself, as sterling had weakened quite a bit, people were holding off and waiting and waiting. And so our, our volumes were kind of, which had been growing pretty strongly, it kind of leveled off. And at the same time, we'd had this, this we were dealing with this issues of transitioning these bank accounts. Um, so as it turned out, when Brexit itself happened, we had an, an absolutely massive month because it, over the period I remember staying up all night that night as the votes were coming in and, uh, you know, rates were, were every time, a, you know, a, a few votes came in one, one place or another, the rate would jump one way. And, um, and, and so it ended up being our, you know, I think that day we, we did almost as much as a normal month, you know, of, of transactions. I was going to but, ask you because surely that sparked massive panic of like, get the money out, get the money out quickly. Yeah, well, and then once it was a leave vote, then Sterling obviously weakened even further than it had even the prior month. So I think after that, um, you know, we had a slightly elevated month the next month, but then things kind of settled down, back down again. And um, so, so that was kind of tough as well because at the time we'd sort of raised an amount of money and based it on where the revenue was going and then we'd had a couple of shocks. And so, so you ha you're having to deal with that kind of thing all the time, which then pushes you back to fundraising again more early than you'd like. And, um, so so that, that's just a few of, the, a few of the, the things that stick in my mind over the years. But um, Yeah, uh, and then Paul, so how did Paul transition into the business? You can take that, Brett, or Paul can kind of take that. Um, well... Uh, yeah, well, uh, from my perspective, um, this was, I think, Paul, you were sort of coming on board just kind of after the Brexit vote, wasn't it? I think um, later that year. Yeah, it was a, yeah, it's a October time frame, wasn't it? We started, we started mm. kind of chatting and uh, I got to know Brett and then got involved. First of all, just helping out Brett and then we kind of fit roles then basically probably in the new area in the new year sometime. Mm. It just kind of felt, it kind of came pretty naturally in the end, like in terms of, my, I suppose, previous experience help been able to help Brett and the company, you know, get, um, scale a bit faster, um, basically as well. Um, Brett willing to want to be play more of a strategy type role in the company. Were you a mentor? Or were you hands on? Were you actually in the office or what? And I was in the office for a bit, for a little bit, probably be about a month or so, and then we just arranged it just to kind of flip the roles as such. Hmm. That was probably towards the end of uh, sixteen, early seventeen. Yeah. Was that a strange transition for you, Brad? I mean, I can't imagine, you know, did you want to go as CEO and go strategic or what was the thinking behind that? Um, well, I guess when I, when I think about it, I really enjoy um, smaller companies in early stages. So I, w I used to love it when we were all in one room <laughs> or even two rooms. Um, but as things got bigger, um, my role became as CEO became less about the things that I love to do and was good at in terms of building product and uh, solving, solving those product related problems um, and more around the, the sort of scaling type issues, which I'm not um, particularly good at nor. So I was learning to do stuff that wasn't in my nature. I wanted to get in there and, and do the product. So from, from my perspective, moving away from that role, which, wasn't a good fit for me and I wasn't enjoying that much and getting back into doing um, the more strategic uh, elements um, or even early stage. And now I'm doing a lot of mentoring uh, sort of for other early stage sort of companies as well. Um, it, was, it was so, so was it strange? It was, um, it was, it's obviously strange because when something's been your whole life for a number of years, and it really is, and I'm sure any other founder would agree with me that, you know, you never switch off from your business when you're, when you're a founder and you're running it like weekends, evenings. Um, and, and, you know, it's probably not that healthy either, but, but that is the way it is. Um, to, to not have, you know, that intense as direct level of responsibility was, was strange, but, uh, but, um, uh, no, it was great. <laughs> really. Was I, I, there? Yeah. It's, it's incredible to to meet someone who has that kind of level of self awareness, who kind of knows what they want to do, but also, 
you know, doesn't have the ego stopping them of kind of going, do you know what? I actually don't want to do this anymore. Was there a moment where you were like, oh, do you know, this actually might be a great solution just to slot Paul in. Was there, was there an event or a moment that kind of sparked it off or was it just kind of a gradual thing as Paul got more involved? You're like, this might be um, well. Well, it was actually even before I met Paul, I'd been starting to think along these lines that um, it might be good to find someone else who's more experienced at the bigger, the, the, the next stage, if you like. Um, so it was, it was something that had probably even earlier in 2016 had been something that I'd been starting to think about. So um so uh yeah it, it would have it would have even been prior to meeting paul and then once paul came along and you know with his track record and um it, it made a huge amount of sense so paul you jumped in in 2016 2017 was it yeah it was kind of early 2017 i think when we um yeah when we kind of probably for, kind of completed the transition over and then since then i guess we've been kind of taking on the company right and uh i know what brett feels because i, did, I remember sold two two previous startups on my own. So I, I kind of absolutely empathize with, with, with what Brett's thoughts at the time, uh, which kind of made it easier for the transition probably for both of us as well, right? Because, you know, um, I had walked in Brett's shoes in that role before um, as well. So yeah, and then we, we took it on and uh, took the business on, uh, maintained the same ethos that Brett had started in terms of the customer first, employee first um, approach and uh, very service oriented employee you know employee relationship oriented as a company and then we've been expanding since then so we've expanded into asia which we did in last year 2019 and we spent a lot of the year just building up our asia business we bought a small company in hong kong at the end of 2000, christmas 2018 and then we set up in early 19 just to, like across asia in terms of opening up singapore and hong kong as markets for us and setting okay. up a corridor into china so trying to just take the business forward into a new you know faster growth markets like in asia is the probably the fastest growing region for the currency bear type type business model which is international uh, payments so let's finally get to the elephant in the room why we're all sitting in three different rooms and not having a chat over a nice coffee in the currency fair offices in Balls Bridge. So, <laughs> uh, well, we're well, need the answer, Gary. We don't have good coffee. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we're chatting. It's, uh, it's April 2020, just for anyone listening in the future. Um, we're in the middle of the COVID-19. I don't even know what you'd call it at this stage. So, Paul, what uh, bring us through kind of your experiences of the last kind of, I suppose, month, over a month now, I guess, we're, we're experiencing it. When did you see things changing? When did you get an early bubble in the markets, or what? What drew your attention? To this as an issue. Yeah, well, for us, I guess we, you know, we've had a phenomenal uh, last couple of weeks of business because a huge number of our customers who are trying to make sense of it themselves have been contacting us to kind of make bring forward some of their payments because there's so much currency volatility at the moment. So we've been, you know, we, up until now, we've basically been shielded a little bit from the economic impacts that other businesses have, and we're thankful for that. Um, and I guess what really brought it home to us was the level of number of customers contacting us, right, trying to find out what they should do. Now, we don't provide advice, right, because we're not, you know, we're not an advisory business. But the number, and we would be quite close to a lot of our customers in terms of they, we know them reasonably well, and they know us quite well at an individual level. So that was kind of the first hint that this was going to be a bigger issue, I think, economically than just a health health issue. Was people in you know all parts of the world contacting us, wanting to know how they could get home, how they could get their money home. And I know there's been a lot of coverage in the Irish media of the you know people stuck in Peru, right? Which they got home I think last week. Well, one one of those one of those people was a good customer of ours, who we I think half the company knows personally, <laughs> mostly because mostly because he spends a lot of time on the phone talking to our staff about different things, right? Yeah. So, so we, we could see that this was a, outside of Ireland. It was a bigger issue than even inside Ireland. I think the Irish impact obviously was felt when the you know restaurants started to close down and bars started to close. So we could see it, and, and, and because we're we have a pretty large presence in Asia, you know, we had seen it in Asia first, but then the impact in Asia wasn't as great because the number of cases was a lot lower than the cases in Europe. You know, the number of people, the number of deaths other than China was quite low, and like Singapore and Hong Kong you know, it was quite low. Singapore stayed open. They didn't have a lockdown until last week. Oh. Uh, Hong Kong have been people are working home s since before Chinese New Year in January. So we've seen since January people working from home. And we are a work from anywhere type company. That, you know, we are, it's all cloud based. People can dial in from anywhere. And um, so it's only, so we, we already could see it coming up slowly. I think what caught everybody at was the speed that the pandemic took over in Europe. Uh, and that's kind of, I suppose, accelerated our thinking around what we do going forward. So we, 
we, we'd be hopeful that Asia will recover faster than Europe. Right. So from our point of view, we're really focused in on trying to scale and grow our Asia business, assuming that the European business will probably take a step back, you know, for, for a period of time, potentially for up to a year, potentially. Um, like, cause nobody really knows on you know, how long it will take to get the virus under control. You know, will there have to be some kind of a treatment plan that's available, you know, really quickly that someone does get sick, then people can get treated really easily. And therefore you can open up, you know, traffic and trade again, because at least you can cure people who get sick or they have to, we have to wait for a vaccine, which is like 18 months away. So, you know, so it's quite difficult to see the longer term future for that. So we're doing what everybody else is doing. We're, just, we're planning, you know, planning for a business having to basically uh, deal with lower revenues potentially. Hopefully it might, it might, it might not happen. And because one, as Brett said, when he started the company in the recession, it was providing great value for people in order to help them save money. That's what the company still does today. So like we're very focused in now on helping small businesses you know, who are still trying to make payments, import goods from, you know, abroad to sell in Ireland. They're still selling into the UK market, for example, you know, trying to help them get better value for their, for their sterling when they bring it back into euros here. So we've, we've done a couple of things, like we launched um, a campaign for in Ireland and Australia because the two markets where the company was founded, as Brett said himself and, and Sean were Australian and the other two founders weren't. So, and the company was originally in Ireland and Australia. So we, in both markets, because they were home markets as for the company, we offered a 15% rebate on, on any charges we make uh, for any of your payments just to those companies in those markets. And it's primarily aimed at existing customers um, as well to try and help them. You know, so we still think there's a lot of opportunity for the company in, in you know, what is a kind of very turbulent situation to help people save money. Um, and of course, the key thing, as Brett said earlier, is getting the message across. You know, you're trying to get people to see that there's alternatives and it's difficult for people to see alternatives when they're so focused in on, the here and now, you know, you know, but it's you know, hopefully people have will have time to step back over the next few weeks and go, you know what? Okay, now I understand how big this crisis is. I can plan around it because I have a better context for what it actually, how big it really is. How do you um, plan as a CEO though of quite a large company? How how do you? What's your process? Can I maybe talk through that because a lot of listeners to the podcast are, are small business owners, maybe zero to ten employees, and they might actually even have definitely don't have a plan in place for this, but they might not, you know, I'm sure you guys have contingency planning and emergency planning. So do you have a process in place so that when an event or a shock, as Brett called it, earlier, happens that you then put in place or is, is it, again, it's so fluid? No, it's so fluid, but uh, we're able to react pretty quickly, right? Because, um, you know, we're used, I suppose like everything else, when you've been around a while, <laughs> you can, you're going to get used to shocks happening. Uh, so in that we're, I'm a, one hand we're fortunate that we have a lot of experienced people in the team, right? So a lot of people have, this isn't their first recession, um, unfortunately. So, you know, we were able to react pretty quickly and we do. So we would take the view that you're better off taking action fast um, and, you know, taking painful action and looking at it in a positive light. Like I, I would be like, Brett, I'd be more an optimist. So, you know, we look at it, okay, we have a company, the company, you know, will be successful question is how long will we have to we have to basically go through a downturn before we can really bounce back and when we bounce back how we bounce back stronger because we will bounce back stronger that's the, you know that's in our nature you know we've, i've seen that before in the businesses we started in the past you know you 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 you, you absorb a shock and it makes you stronger right um so so we plan for that and we plan and we communicate with the employees and we have to we have to take tough cost decision cost measures we take them because you're ultimately trying to protect the interest of all your employees, right? And all your customers. Um, and that's what you've got to think in that light. And you, unfortunately, you can't obs um, obsess around one individual, like, or, which could be yourself, or it could be one employee, you know, who has a particular, I suppose, financial commitment that you're trying to get ahead of, help that person to get around that. You got to look at the bigger picture um, in, in terms of what's right for the company and what's right for all the employees as a group. And it's hard. Um, but you got to make quick decisions and not, you know, and then take the opportunity when you've made the decisions to step back and go, okay, am I making the right decisions? What, and what kind of business do I want to come back as? And, um, you know, when things improve, and things will improve. Like I was just, we were just thinking, and we were working over the weekend on, on, a, on this in communication plan was, in the context of everybody working from home, let's say you have young children, right? They're probably at this stage getting under your feet in the house. And you, um, but in six months time, you'll probably look back and go, geez, that was great to be able to spend so much time with my kids. So rather than spend an hour and a half in the car each way commuting to work, <laughs> you know, you look, you look back and you'll see the positives in it. And that's what yeah. we say to all our employees. Look, look at the positives now, right? You know, yes, you're working at home. Yes, it's difficult. Yes, it's uncertain. 
but at the end of the day, you still have your health, right? You don't have a commuting, commuting time. It's spend more time with your families. And when this is all over, there'll probably be a whole change in the whole working environment generally for people. More company. Obviously remote working was, was bubbling and was coming and coming and coming and coming. Do you think this has just skyrocketed that or will it be people will be like, oh geez, I want to go back to the office? I think people want to go back to the office part time because like hum we're humans, right? We need social yeah. interaction. Um, in fact, we'd be advocating at a uh, and I'd be advocating at a personal level for a whole change in their working their work working model. Um, like we haven't seen now the way people work and haven't and haven't seen how we we work actually works abroad, right? Because we operate at some we work offices internationally. That you know, why can't you advocate in Ireland for like working hubs in 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 commuter towns where people can you know share space with other companies in the town and then maybe maybe you you come you commute into the Dublin one or two days a week. Right, but the other three I'm working on an idea like that. I might connect you with him if you haven't met him already. Yeah, him because him. I, think, I think that's the way, because it solves two issues. It solves the housing crisis to a certain extent because it means now you can afford to live, you know, way down the, way down the country, right? You know, um, and I'm from the country, so I can say this, <laughs> to, yeah, that you can live, you know, you can live in, in uh, Offaly or Leash or Westmead and commute halfway to Dublin, right, yeah. to, to a hub and share that hub like a, a mini WeWork office. And then come into Dublin one or two days a week. So you can then build your family life and whatever else outside of Dublin where housing is better valued, there's more land available. Um, and you'd hope to be quicker access to housing because things could maybe move a bit quicker. Um, so like, does, I think we have to, as a country, take, take the current crisis and then rethink how we actually work, right? Um, as, the, as, a, uh, as an economy and not have everybody chasing trains and traffic into Dublin every day to work in wherever it is in the center of Dublin. Like, you know, ultimately Dublin, is on the coast, right? It's like San Francisco um, or Boston. You know, you have to come from west to east or north to south, right? You, it's not as you can't you, you can't live on four four sides of the country. And then there's mountains on one part of it, so there's not not a lot of routes in or spokes into into the hub. So we got to find a smarter way to work. And I think working from home will become much more the norm, you know, um, and for people. And we like we do we because we have a number of smaller offices around the world. Dublin being the main office. We kind of have that like hub and spoke mentality anyway. Now, obviously, people don't commute to Dublin from Singapore or Australia too frequently, but it's the same type of model, right? You know, yeah. um, and we have people who go there, for example. You know, I, I'm obviously traveling a fair bit where I was traveling a fair bit anyway, as was Brett before me. So in that sense, I'm connecting back with everybody in, in each of the countries we operate in. So I think that will become the new normal for work. And I think it will make the country a better place, actually, in terms of better quality of life for everybody, less greenhouse emissions, greenhouse gases, better, better climate, more time at home, less time in, less time in traffic. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think exactly the same as yourself. I used to do two days at, at home, Monday, Friday, I just sandwiched a week. Um, I think that's exactly what people do. I think this will give people a lot of pause for thought. Um, people mm -hmm. who probably never had the opportunity to work from home, who never kind of knew what it might be like. And also employers like yourselves, um, will evolve their model now to, to, to cater to people's new demands. Cause I think people will come back from this going, look exactly what you said there. I need to spend a bit more time with my kids. I need to cut that commute down. It's killing me. This, I have a whole new, new respect for working from home now. And then Brett for yourself, how has this last couple of weeks been? Uh, a little bit surreal in, in some ways, um, as I think it has been for everyone. I, I definitely think it's, um, uh, I mean, luckily, I'm in a period where I'm not full-time working at the moment. So uh, what I would normally be doing now is probably going into dog patch labs and helping out with um, some incubator programs that would have been due to start um, okay. in, in the next week or two, but th that's probably postponed. Um, so I've just uh, really been doing my own thing. There's a couple of things I'm working on as well, and um, I'm learning Spanish, so I'm keeping busy, but, uh, nice. but it's certainly <laughs> strange. But um, I think it's, I, I, you know, there's a reasonable chance, as Paul said, that we're a long, we're a reasonable long way from a, from an actual definitive end to this. Um, now there may be ways that it lightens up a bit, so you could see us sort of coming partially out of lockdown, or you know maybe wearing face masks a lot and being tracked on our phones, so that we you know if they, and you know a lot of um, testing and, and tracking and that kind of thing. But it's a reasonable chance that you know for a, a good few months, there's it's it's going to be at least a good few months, I'd say, before life goes back to what it used to be completely normally. 
so so I think we're definitely accelerating changes that might have taken 10 years to happen in the absence of this into into a much smaller period of time. Uh, I know socially, I'm sure I'm not alone by of, of having caught up with some mates over drinks over Zoom. Um, in, the, in the last few weeks, um, which is a kind of strange experience, but it's starting to feel like the new normal. Um, so, yeah, interesting times. Obviously, uh, we're, we're all um, we're all trying to do our bit, I guess. And, and you know, we, we do get out and do a bit of exercise, but literally we asked, you know, in our house, household staying home pretty much the whole time, just going out to the shops when we need to, because um, whilst we we're probably not in a high risk category at our ages, there, there are people that are. So, um, you know, so it's, it's a bit of people pulling together uh, at the same time. So, but uh, yeah, it'll be a strange thing to look back on anyway, and hopefully the, it won't be as, as bad as it could be. Yeah, you were CEO for, as, as you said it yourself, a couple of shocks. So one thing I'm kind of fascinated by at the minute is reaction. Underreaction, reaction, overreaction. How did you find that for your shocks? How did you know, right, this is where we need to be? We need to act fast or we need to take a moment or we need to, you know, how did you balance that? Uh, it's a good question. Because I guess, depending on the nature of the shock, you kind of don't know, including this one, where it's going to go. So you're never really going to know what's the appropriate level of action, do you know? Um, so it is probably best in that sense to overreact rather than underreact. In other words, assume that it's going to be worse than it will probably be, um, because it's it's easier to pull back um, from from taking extra action and then wind it back if it's no longer necessary than it is to take a bit of action, then have to take more action, then more action, then more action. So, so I think worst case uh, scenario analysis is super important here. And, you know, companies, any businesses I'm sure need is, is looking at their cash flow now and, and assuming that the worst case on their revenue, even if, if you're an early stage company, assuming your revenue is, is zero for a while or, you know, whatever's appropriate in the kind of business you're in uh, and then mapping out your cash flow accordingly, uh, looking at where you can extend it and all the different options and making that a real a key focus. So, yeah, I would, I would, I would err on the side of caution in, 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 in a shock, in a shock like this one. Well, for yourselves, as you look kind of, again, just to echo on what Brad said there, you, you said the same thing in terms of react quick and react hard. What's, what's your kind of plan as, as you live with the uncertainty of the next kind of couple of weeks or months or whatever it would be? How do you see Currency Fair kind of moving through the next couple of months? No, well, we're we're very focused in on, and Brett, I think touched on it there in terms of how we do, how we how we react, right, and plan for. So we're, we we will be probably plan on a more much more conservative scenario than hopefully it'll turn out to be the case so so you don't you know you end up being positively surprised rather than negatively surprised and that would be what we do the last thing you really want to try and avoid is the old scenario of debt by a thousand cuts right so you know you, you're over optimistic you make a change it doesn't work you make another change and suddenly you know you're four changes in and you're still struggling to get ahead of yourself so we would we would probably kind of plan for a much more conservative scenario on day one and then track and track and track and make sure that, you know, we weren't optimistic because you don't, you don't know in the current shock environment what an optimism is or pessimism is on, it's just, it'll just be a new reality every day. Um, so you just plan for what you think might happen conservatively uh, and then you just uh, execute accordingly, you know, and, and there's changes in your cost structures or whatever, or changes in your marketing strategy, you know, Rick will be re realigning, for example, more, more our sales and marketing strategy towards Asia because we do think ultimately Asia will recover faster. You know, China is already trying to get their factories back up. Uh, we have a business in and out of China uh, and uh, you know, that they, um, trying to get up to, they're trying to get the factories back to 60, 70% capacity this month. You know, so I know they took a step back the weekend when they had more new cases of COVID-19 in the country, um, but still they are moving forward, right? You know, they've celebrated the, the martyrs of the of the pandemic is uh, you know last week so they they're moving forward so we're, that's what we'll be focusing on where can we engineer growth from you know because not every not every business is in decline right so you know some like any medtech businesses particularly anybody in the ppc um or ppe world basically are doing quite well certain terms of e-commerce business is doing quite well and we can see how we can service those businesses like on some of our customers businesses have been you know have been decimated like we would deal a lot with say car garages importing cars into Ireland like for example their, their business is, is zero so you know it's trying to it's trying to find green shoots of opportunity for every business and I think if you cut hard early you buy more time to find that rather than ch constantly chasing the next cost cut 
um, as Brett said, like cut hard and cut early. Um, um, and while you might be an optimist as a business leader and a founder of the company, you need to be a pessimist in, 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 in a shock and, and then, you know, give yourself more time to react to chase new business opportunities or, you know, use the opportunity to re- refocus on what type of business you actually want to be, you know, in a year's time and then work, work, work into that plan. That's what we're, that's what we're doing. We're, we're close to wrapping up. So I'll just ask you, Paul, you've nearly answered it there, but um, I'll just ask you both one last question. If you were, you know, an entrepreneur running a smaller business, say between one and five people, what would you be doing now to kind of prepare yourself, as you said there, Paul, for a kind of a post COVID world of, you know, green shoots or what would you be doing now to help yourself prepare for the next six months? Start with yeah. and wrap up with Brett. Okay. Well, I think first thing I do is I'd have to reel on my, ca- my cash flow and figure out, okay, what, like, do I have enough money for a year? Right, roughly. Do I, uh, and if I don't, how do I get that cash? Do I have to bring in revenue to, to make the number because I can't get it from elsewhere? Okay, what revenue do I need to bring in and how, where do I get it from? And try and figure out what we, what changes you think are going to happen, right? You know, like the whole change in the working, working model, working from home, does that, op- does, that, does that open an avenue of opportunity for your business in terms of how those people get serviced? Like, you know, simple examples. We've seen it lately, all the restaurants reopening as takeaways, right? That's, a, you know, that's a new business model. It keeps the restaurants going. So try and figure out other ways you can adapt your business to the change in economic world in the next 12 months. Or if you can't, okay, what do you need to do to mudball and try and figure out what the world will look like in 12 months time in terms of the business you used to have, will it be the same business? You know, in terms of it's a manufacturing company, will people want to buy the same things you're manufacturing or need to repurpose your factory or your outlet or will you have the same demand for your goods in foreign markets as you have today? Um, and try and buy yourself time to think, to step back and think it through, right? And, and think it through logically and, you know, in terms of planning different outcomes. And if you have the time because you've cut hard, then you will have the time to step back and go, okay, look, let me take a few days now to kind of step back here and think about it. Because every month will bring you information and you have to be very flexible. You have to be able to change on a dime, you know, literally, literally uh, because there will be, you know, new, there might be a release, a release of the lockdown, in which case manufacturing might get started again. It might go the opposite way, in which case some factories may never reopen. Then you got to look, well, then there's import substitution. Can you import those goods that used to be manufactured here from somewhere else like China or, or somewhere in Asia? And um, so that's what's, that's, I think, the, so I think just be flexible, but, but look, just keep watching your cash flow the whole time and try and figure out what business you want to be. Brilliant. Brett? Yeah, well, I think Paul pretty much captured it there. Um, I, <laughs> what is that? I'd, I'd agree a hundred percent. I mean, the absolute first point is is cash flow and runway. Like that was the first thing I'd be looking at. Um, what is my runway? And assuming a worst case revenue situation, um, and then if that's not at least a year, um, you, you've got to look at what you can do to get it to a year. So, so that's your absolute first point. And once you once you've got that into a, a situation where you're more comfortable um, or as comfortable as you can be and taking whatever decisions, use whatever tools, looked at government supports, looked at everything you can do to get that runway sorted. Then I, I, I think as Paul said, you've got to have, you've got to start taking a view on, on the world and where it's going and, and, you know, with, with the lens of your own business uh, in what ways can you adapt or change that to, to fit in better uh, with, with the way he, you think th- things are going to turn out. Listen, Paul, Brett, thank you so much for taking the time to chat to me today. No problem at all. It's been brilliant. Cheers, Gary. Cheers, Brett. Cheers, Paul.